reason or another, people take an amazing number of chances. Some of us seem to get a thrill out of it. But more often than not, we get ourselves into dangerous situations through carelessness or thoughtlessness. Usually we think to ourselves, nothing is going to happen to me. Some people may have to pay the piper, but I'm not one of them. Back in the days when the fringe top Surrey was the latest thing in transportation, this penchant for chance taking was less of a hazard simply because there were fewer opportunities to take chances. Even when the Surrey owner traded in old Dobbin on a one-cylinder engine, our latent risk-taking characteristics had little opportunity for expression. Fifteen miles per hour was a dangerous speed, and the horseless carriage was approached with awe and trepidation by anyone who aspired to operate. But swifter models appeared, and soon the local daredevil was speeding recklessly at about a half a mile a minute, and everybody was driving at 15 and 20 without giving it a thought. And so it went until in the 1930s, father could drive at 50 and 60, and mother wouldn't criticize, that is, unless she happened to glance at the speedometer. Along with the speed and comfort it had brought us, the machine age had also made it easier for us to take chances. Like the automobile, the airplane is essentially a safe and dependable mechanism, provided it is operated by a thoroughly competent pilot who knows and respects the airplane's limitations as well as his own. But it's even easier to take risks with an airplane, whether deliberately or through carelessness. The odds against the chance taker are greater, and the penalties more severe. To protect the naval aviator against this human tendency toward chance taking and carelessness, the Navy has established quite a number of routines and regulations, including such items as the pre-flight inspection and testing procedure, which you have already seen. Of equal importance with these is the daily flight inspection form. Every day before the first flight, the plane captain inspects his plane according to the inspection form, checking each item as he inspects it. But you say this inspection, which is carried out by the plane captain, is the same as a pre-flight inspection the pilot is supposed to make. Right. But that is one of those safety precautions whereby the Navy endeavors to make flying more safe for you. You and the plane captain are both human. He might miss something. You might miss something. So you both inspect and test the plane. Also, you are the one who will be up there in the airplane, not the plane captain. So you'll want to make your own inspection anyway. When the plane captain has completed his inspection, he signs the report form, certifying that the airplane is ready for flight. During the day, each pilot to whom that plane is assigned glances over the form to see that all items have been checked and that the plane captain has signed the form. Next, he glances down at the section of the form on which each pilot reports the condition of his plane after flight. If no defects have been found in the plane during flight, the previous pilot will have written OK, followed by his signature. If some defect has been found, it will be noted. If the difficulty has been corrected, this statement will be followed by the OK and signature of the person authorized to approve the plane for flight. If the plane has been subjected to any unusual stress or strain during flight, Bureau regulations specify that this also must be reported, both in writing on the form and verbally to the squadron duty officer. However, if previous pilots have reported the plane OK, or if all defects have been corrected and OK, then the pilot signs in this space, indicating that he has inspected and tested the plane, and that he accepts it for flight. In the case of a dual hop, including both student and instructor, the instructor signs the report form. When a student is going up for a solo hop, he signs the form. Can you hear me all right? Better put your goggles down. Always adjust them before leaving the line. Dust in your eyes at the wrong moment can get you into trouble. And of course, flying regularly without goggles can injure your eyes permanently. Also, right from the beginning, get used to glancing at the tower before you leave the line to find out the direction and approximate strength of the wind. 
and the number of the course on which you're to take off. Also, look at the course flag to find out the direction of traffic around the field and whether or not you're clear to leave the line. We give the plane captain the thumbs up signal to remove the chocks and hold the brakes while he does it. turn it by lowering one end of the wing and raising the other end. We bank the wing to the right for a right turn, to the left for a left turn. No matter what you may have thought in the past, the only correct way to turn the wing is by banking it. But in order to conveniently fly the wing, we need certain controls which will make it assume the attitudes we have just demonstrated. For example, suppose we put movable control surfaces on the trailing edge of each side of the wing. These we call ailerons. If we put the right aileron up, that will make the right end of the wing want to go down. And if at the same time we put the left aileron down, that will make the left end of the wing want to go up. Thus we put the wing into a right bank, which as we have seen will make it turn to the right. If the bank is shallow, you get a slow rate of turn. Steepen up the bank and the turn becomes sharper. So the amount you bank the wing determines the sharpness of your turn. But here's an odd situation. We use the ailerons to bank the plane. But once the bank is established, we don't need them anymore. If we let them come back to neutral, the wing remains in the same degree of bank and turn until we apply the ailerons the other way to bring it out of the turn. An easy way to control the tilt of the wing to make it want to go up or down is to add other control surfaces back here. These are called elevators. 
If we tilt them this way, the air forces the tail down, and that in turn tilts the wing up. If we tilt the elevators this way, the air will force the tail up, and that in turn tilts the wing down. But the elevators are usually attached to the wing by a fuselage. Also, the tail assembly is not complete without the addition of the rudder, the most misunderstood control on the airplane. The use of the rudder will be demonstrated later. Now, put an engine on our wing and we have an airplane, which is no different in its basic essentials from the primary trainer. Except the chances are your primary trainer will be a biplane having two wings instead of one. We've already seen how the various control surfaces affect the attitude of the airplane. Now let's look at it from the pilot's viewpoint. We pull the stick back. That tilts the wings up, bringing the nose of the plane toward the pilot. If we push the stick forward, that tilts the wings down, pushing the nose away from the pilot. If we put the stick over to the right, that banks the plane to the right, pushing the right wing away from the pilot and bringing the left wing toward him. If we put the stick over to the left, it banks the airplane to the left, pushing the left wing away from the pilot and bringing the right wing toward him. When you move the stick forward and back, you operate only the elevators. When you move it from side to side, you operate only the ailerons. But you can also operate both at once, in countless combinations. For instance, if you want to push the nose and the right wing away from you at the same time, you do this. Then if you want to bring the nose and the wing back toward you, you do this. And remember that the effect of the controls in relation to you is the same, regardless of the attitude of the airplane. In a glide, if you pull back on the stick, the nose will come toward you. In a turn, exactly the same thing is true. Pull back on the stick and the nose comes toward you. Turn the plane upside down. Pull the stick back and we're still pulling the nose toward you. Push the stick away from you and you push the nose away from you. Push the stick over to the right and you push the right wing away from you and pull the left wing toward you, regardless of whether your plane is upside down or right side up or vertical. You are the center of things. All controls operate in relation to you, regardless of the attitude of the airplane. flyer seems to have the idea that flying an airplane is like walking a tightrope, that you're struggling every second to keep the plane up there. But actually, the average well-rigged airplane is very easy to fly. Now you take over the controls and we'll trim the plane so it'll fly with a minimum of effort on your part. Let's experiment a little with the trim pad. Move it forward and the stick wants to go forward. The more you move the tab forward, the greater the forward pressure exerted on your hand by the stick. Move the tab back and the stick wants to go back. And the more you move it back, the greater the back pressure. Now try to adjust it so there's no pressure at all on the stick. Get it just right and if the air is smooth, you can take your hand off the stick entirely for a moment. Got your hands off? As a matter of fact, you can also cruise many planes straight and level without any rudder control. Of course, you won't actually want to fly that way. That was only a demonstration of how inherently stable the plane is. One of the first steps in learning to fly is to develop the ability to hold the plane in this attitude. Notice the position of the nose on the horizon. And the wings. Notice their position in relation to the horizon. 
You can tell they're level by the fact that you can see the same amount of sky under each side of the top weight. You remember in a previous film, we illustrated the correct use of the eyes by demonstrating that a person can look straight ahead and yet see objects on either side and even slightly back of his eyes, giving him in all a range of vision covering approximately 210 of the 360 degrees. Seated in the cockpit of the airplane, you should be able to look ahead and still see the attitude of your wings without looking directly at them. Of course, our friend McDribble, as might be expected, has failed entirely to get the significance of this point. His attention is concentrated on keeping one particular boat on the engine right on the horizon. In other words, he has put on the blinders. He sees only the position of that boat on the horizon. And look what happens. You'll probably have a good deal of trouble maintaining the attitude you want until you learn how to use that full 210 degree range of vision. Also learn to use your ears in judging the plane's attitude. Listen to the engine. It's not laboring or racing. It's running along at a steady, comfortable pace. You want to get used to that sound. Sight, sound, and feel, the way you feel in the cockpit, all help you to keep the plane in level flight. But how do you hold the plane in this straight and level attitude? Actually, you don't hold it there. You can't. Even when the plane is trimmed up, its attitude is subject to frequent change without notice. A wing drops a little, so you pick it up. Your nose wanders slightly to one side or the other of your heading. You bring it back. So flying straight and level is merely a matter of helping the plane by being on the ball, ready to bring it back to straight and level attitude the instant it gets off. Previously, we said that an airplane is turned by banking the wing. But if that's the case, then what's the rudder for? A boat is turned by its rudder, so lots of people think that an airplane, likewise, is turned by its rudder. Let's try it and see what happens. Keeping our wings level, we press right rudder. Sure enough, the nose comes around to the right. It looks like we're turning, but are we? Let's repeat that same maneuver, watching it from a different point of view. Our present heading is along that highway below, and we want to make a 90 degree turn to a new heading. We apply right rudder. Our nose comes around all right, but the plane itself tries to continue skidding right along the same old course. The only difference being that the nose is cocked off to the right. If you hold the plane this way long enough, it will gradually change its course very much as a racing car on a dirt track skids around a flat turn. However, we are not turning, we are skidding around the turn. It is a very sloppy and incidentally a very dangerous operation. Now let us try making a turn by banking the plane. If we want to turn to the right, we bank the plane to the right. But instead of immediately starting a right turn, the plane hesitates and may even pull off a little to the left. This is because of the increased resistance of the outside aileron. So the plane gets into the turn rather awkwardly. However, once the bank is established and the turn started, the plane behaves very nicely until we're ready to bring it out of the turn. And then again, recovery to straight flight is quite sloppy. So we need something to facilitate entry into and recovery from turns. First, something to counteract the plane's hesitation or momentary tendency to turn away from the direction of bank. And that is one of the functions of the rudder. Right rudder, as we have seen, will make the nose want to pull over to the right. So right rudder and the plane's tendency to turn to the left will cancel each other out leaving the plane free to turn smoothly to the right when banked to the right. But let's stop the picture again. We have already seen that once the plane has entered the turn and the bank is established, we no longer need right aileron. As a matter of fact, we may even need a little left aileron to keep the plane from banking too much. And since right rudder was needed only to counteract aileron resistance, naturally we no longer need any right rudder. Thus, we continue on around the turn to the new heading. To bring the plane out of the turn, we use left aileron, combining it with a little left rudder to counteract aileron resistance. What's this? 
past, we might have known that only McDribble could be responsible for such strange execution. Look, Mac, that stick isn't going to get away from you. You don't have to strangle it, and you don't have to manhandle the airplane. Be gentle, but firm. Take it easy. Hold the stick lightly. Remember, you're taking the pulse of the airplane at all times. Your knees should be relaxed with the weight of your legs on your heels and the balls of your feet resting lightly on the rudder paddles. There. That's better. Now let's try a few turns. And here's what a good turn looks like from the pilot's point of view. The instant your wings leave the level attitude and begin a bank, the nose begins to move smoothly in the direction of bank. Let's go back and do that again. The instant your wings leave the level attitude and begin a bank, the nose begins to move smoothly in the direction of bank. After the turn is established, the angle of bank, that is the angle the wings make with the horizon, remains constant. And the nose remains on the horizon as in straight and level flight. Then, when you're ready to recover from the turn, your nose stops moving at the same instant your wings reach the level attitude. Not a second sooner or later. You achieve this kind of turn by using a combination of aileron and rudder in the right amounts and in proper relation to each other. In other words, you coordinate rudder with aileron. One of the easiest ways of knowing whether or not you're properly coordinating your aileron and rudder is by watching the way the nose moves. If on entering a turn the nose hesitates and then starts to move, chances are you're not using enough rudder, or you're applying your rudder too late. But if on entering a turn the nose moves too fast, you're probably using too much rudder, or you're applying rudder too soon. Experiment with your rudder pedals until you get the right adjustment to give you a smooth, well-balanced turn. And try to feel the balance of the turn. If you feel like you're being pushed one side or the other in the cockpit, even slightly, the chances are your turn is not balanced. Again, experiment gently with your rudders until that unbalanced feeling disappears. But just making a turn is one thing. Making a turn which comes out on a specific and predetermined heading is something else. Here again, if you will draw on your experiences in driving out a mobile, you can avoid some of the most common mistakes in turns. An intersection like this one forces the automobile driver to make a very sharp turn. But at a broad intersection like this, no driver in his right mind would turn so sharply. No, he'd take advantage of the extra room and make a much more gentle, more comfortable turn. Likewise in the air. Suppose we're flying along a course like this, and want to change heading 90 degrees to a course like this. If we wait too long to start our turn, we'll have to make our bank steep and the turn sharp, which would be just as foolish as the automobile driver going clear out to the middle of the intersection and then making a sharp angle turn. But if we start back here, we can make a gentle turn with a very shallow bank, very much as the automobile driver does, wherever the limits of the intersection will allow him. Another very common mistake which students make in connection with turns may also be illustrated in the automobile. When a motorist makes a turn, he doesn't whip the wheel around suddenly into the desired degree of turn and then whip it back again after he reaches the new heading. No, he enters the turn much more gently, turning the steering wheel slowly to give him just the degree of turn he wants. Then, as he sees he's approaching his new heading, he starts to straighten out ahead of time, so that he reaches the new heading at the same instant his wheels are once more pointed straight ahead. Likewise, except where necessity demands it, the experienced pilot doesn't whip suddenly into a bank and then whip out of it. Rather, wherever possible, he plans his turn well ahead, so he has plenty of room for it. He enters the bank unhurriedly, continuing to steepen it up until he's established the bank, which will give him the rate of turn he wants. If he sees he's turning too wide and is in danger of overshooting his new heading, he can steepen up the bank, thereby making his turn sharper. 
On the other hand, if he sees he's turning too short and is in danger of undershooting his new heading, he can shallow his bank, thereby making his turn less sharp. Then, when he sees he's coming around to the new heading, he begins slowly to decrease his bank, planning his recovery from the turn in such a way that his wings are level and the nose stops turning at the same instant he reaches the new heading. Learning to make precision turns and to keep the plane in balanced flight is half of learning to fly. So practice turns at every opportunity and try to be conscious of the plane's balance every second you're in the air.